All right. Well, cool, guys. Well, thank you for hopping on for our third monthly panel Q&A. Uh, Josh Tannis filled in for me last time. So now you guys can compare and see who does better at this. And that will decide who we're going to have. Um, we have a few questions pre-submitted right now. Uh, but first, I want to give each of our panelists, Jonathan, Cody, and David, a chance to introduce themselves. So Jonathan, for the third time, you want to introduce yourself on a monthly panel? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, I live in Boston, though I'm currently in Austria and visiting my my uh, in-laws. And I, I work as an assistant professor of biology at Sattler College. Uh, I teach a number of different courses. I teach uh, freshman biology, uh, microbiology, genetics and genomics, bioethics, anatomy and physiology. And I'm also a fellow of the Discovery Institute, Center for Science and Culture. So um, a lot of my focus and, and research has been on the subject of evidence of design in nature, especially in my own area of expertise, which is in the life sciences. I'm also fascinated by uh, New Testament scholarship, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, and so forth. And so that's my other area of specialization. So uh, yeah, great to be with you all. Looking forward to engaging with your questions. Cool. Always happy to have a beginner like yourself with us, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, Cody, you want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, I'm Cody. Um, I'm an undergrad, actually, at Reinhardt University. I live in Canton, Georgia, and also have a big passion and interest in apologetics, especially, um, you know, New Testament, gospel, New Testament reliability, and as well as philosophy and epistemology and all that fun stuff, and happy to be on here. Very cool. I love it. And then finally, David, you want to introduce yourself and then also tell us every single book you have on the shelf behind you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, nice to meet you. So my name is David, David Galloway. Uh, I'm retired, so I can tell you that working life is seriously overrated. Uh, so my background is a medical graduate from University of Glasgow. My career was uh, trained as a general surgeon, uh, worked in my undergrad postgraduate years in, in Glasgow, in London, in New York City for a while, became a surgical oncologist and spent most of my working life in a university teaching hospital. When I retired from the health service, a couple of interesting things happened. Uh, <clears throat> number one, I was elected to be president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, which is a an ancient surgical and medical college going back to 1599. And so I ran that organization for three years. And they basically, together with three other uh, significant ancient surgical colleges, look after postgraduate training and education for, for doctors and hospital specialties of various kinds. So that was a fun thing to do. And I also took on a role as a volunteer surgeon in a mission hospital in northwestern Zambia, which is literally away in the sticks of uh, rural Zambia, and uh, found myself not just being the general surgeon, but the physician, the urologist, the gynecologist, the neurosurgeon, the thoracic surgeon, uh, everything that came through the door. Uh, so that was a fantastic experience as well. In terms of books, uh, I've been cranking out a few books during the, the uh, pandemic, and so uh, produced a little book about some of our African adventures, which is called Controlled Chaos. It was never intended to be a book, but I had I'd basically assembled a whole load of, of kind of blog articles that I used to send to people and, uh, and realized after several visits to Africa that I had about 160,000 words. So I kind of distilled that down into a little summary of some of the activities and the adventures that we got up to there. And I've written two more apologetics type books uh, one with a fairly clinical angle, just as a challenge to naturalism, which is called Design Dissected. And the other one, which I wrote with a PhD chemist colleague called Follow the Science. It's more for high school students, undergraduate level books, just challenging the kind of mantra that, that if we follow science, then we'll get to the sort of truth consensus that seems to be accepted as the default out there in the wider world. And so... It was really just an attempt to uh, to have a swing at that and see what came out of it. So these have done okay. And uh, I've been working on some stuff on medical ethics and so on. So uh, lots of interest and lots to keep me going. I'm involved in quite a number of charities and so on. But uh, Jonathan 
strong-armed me into becoming involved a little bit with Talk About Doubt. So it's been a pleasure to do that too. Awesome. Well, very cool, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys uh, hopping on. And then for those that don't know me, I'm Justin. I'm a former inquirer of Talk About Doubts, now just kind of an autodidact, trying to trying to keep up with everyone. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, so we have some questions pre-submitted through the Discord. Uh, but I do want to encourage you guys, if you have other questions coming out, uh, please submit them either in the Zoom chat or in the Discord channel on the general announcements. Uh, and I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout our time today and trying to get all the questions answered. So first one we have uh, is a little more <clears throat> kind of the emotional, mental side of things. Uh, it says, my biggest issues lately is that it seems like no matter how many apologetics I read or watch or listen to, I can't escape these thoughts. Like that just seems so unlikely or improbable or nonsensical. I'm afraid that naturalist explanations may be true. For example, surrounding the resurrection experiences and evidences. How do we overcome cognitive dissonance, even when we know the arguments? I want God to exist, to be perfect and good, for Jesus' death and resurrection to somehow enable us to exist in harmony with that state. But I don't understand how it all works, and I'm terrified that it could not be true. Uh, Jonathan, you want me to kick us off on that? Um, okay. Yeah, cool. I, I I absolutely don't think that you have to uh, know all of the have all of your ans all of your questions answered to your satisfaction or understand everything there is to know about Christianity in order to have a robustly um, rationally justified Christian faith. Uh, I, I think that um, a, a review a survey of the of the positive evidence for Christianity is enough to justify Christian belief, even in the absence of fully satisfactory answers. To all of your questions, I, I do think it's important to draw a distinction between questions and objections. Not all questions are objections. Questions might express uh, objections, but for a question to become an objection, you need an additional premise, either that we do know the answer and until some sort of internal inconsistency or is odds with empirical data, or that we don't know the answer and if Christianity were true, we should expect to know the answer. Short of that additional premise, it's, it's only a question. We don't need to necessarily know everything there is to know um, or understand exactly um, everything there is, is to know about God in order to be rational in affirming Christianity is true. I would also argue that you don't necessarily even need to know the answers to all of um, the objections that might be raised against Christianity in order to have a rationally justified Christian faith. Uh, this is what uh, the um, Christian philosopher Richard Whitley in his uh, Elements of Logic called the fallacy of objections, where one uh, gets so uh, fixated on objections that may be leveled against the Christian faith that one misses the pillar of positive confirmatory data. And it's important uh, not to do that. We want to survey all of the evidence. And uh, in view of the uh, and what, we, what we want to evaluate is where does the preponderance of evidence lie? And of course, in our assessment, the preponderance of evidence lies heavily in on the side of Christianity, even though there is also, we freely confess, evidence to the contrary as well. Um, and uh, and one one uh, cognitive uh, bias that I have uh, noticed uh, in a lot of conversations I've had with people with doubts or people who've walked away from the Christian faith is what I've called uh, the disconfirmation bias. Right? We all know what confirmation bias is, where you um, look at the evidence that favors your preferred conclusion, and then you tend to ignore that evidence which doesn't uh, comport with your favored conclusion, um, and there's there, there's also a tendency among some to go to the other side where they are so concerned about the impact of their of their confirmation bias upon their reasoning and their thinking that they are more trusting of resources and literature and arguments that argues against their preferred conclusion um, and so it's, it's important to to bear that in mind as we evaluate and appraise the the evidence. So th these are just a few pointers that, that I would say there. Um, Cody or David or, or Justin, anything to add there? Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Cody. No, I was just going to say, uh, so I was thinking a little about this, you know, the fallacy of objections. Bit. One thing I think might help is to almost relate it to a non-religious type of matter. So I remember a few years ago, I actually met uh, a moon landing conspiracy theorist, uh, somebody who really thought that the moon landing in 1969 was faked. And he had this one particular objection that he kept giving. Uh, it involved like the crater or something below the, the, the actual spaceship. And at the time, I remember I didn't know how to answer the objection, but yet I knew I wasn't ra it wouldn't have been rational for me to suddenly say, oh, gee, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know if I can believe that the moon landing happened. Well, no, because I was aware of all the preponderance of evidence for 
the moon landing conspiracy theorists that therefore I knew it was silly, even though I didn't right there have an answer to it, to it would have been silly for me to abandon my belief that the moon landing was real. And it also relates in the sense because in, for all these conspiracy theorists like that, there are so many objections out there that you go on the internet, there's tons of them. And yet I'm not at all troubled <laughs> by the conspiracy theorists because I know the positive evidence for it is so powerful. So I find that for me, it helps at least to think of more of other types of examples like that. And you can almost see how silly it is to fall prey to things like the fallacy of objections. Yeah, I would take a different approach, I think. Uh, I mean, it sounded as though the questioner was quite persuaded about the potential explanatory value of naturalistic explanations for things like the resurrection. I would want to ask the question, you know, well, what is what is the evidence that anything beyond nature is actually possible? I would want to, to really sow the seed of doubt in terms of any confidence that someone had on materialism or naturalism as an explanation for pretty much anything absolutely basic. You know, you can really go right back to, well, what's the explanation for anything to exist, for example? I mean, is there anything like a naturalistic explanation? No, of course not. What about the origin of life? Is there is there anything close to, or even likely to get close to a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life? No, absolutely not. What about the laws of nature? None, absolute nothing. What about information? Well, no, there's there's maybe naturalistic evidence for chaos, but not for information, not for consciousness, not for reason. So I think you can sow the seeds of doubt into someone's confidence in a naturalistic understanding of things. And then it's a matter of, uh, I mean, I suppose, I suspect behind this sort of question, the person is maybe anxious about what appears to be miraculous. Uh, so how do you explain a miracle? Well, without getting into uh, Humean philosophy and so on, I mean, I think a miracle essentially is something for which there is no adequate naturalistic explanation. And there's plenty of evidence of many, many things that are totally rational to believe when there's no rational explanation by a naturalistic means. And so if you can sort of frame the argument that way and then look at the evidence that Jonathan was talking about, then I think uh, you're potentially going to win over a doubter in that sort of setting. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to chime in too, as, as one of those doubters that Jonathan talked about experiencing the disconfirmation bias with, um, I would say like my first initial kind of crisis of faith lasted probably three months longer than it needed to because of this fear of disconfirmation bias. And it wasn't until Lydia McGrew called me out on it that I realized like I'm totally doing this. Uh, where, yeah, especially for if people like me, I have an anxiety and OCD disorder. So I think that even kind of more heavily bent me towards discounting positive evidence and just kind of my pessimism that's kind of naturally wired in um taking over and me almost not believing christianity no matter what because it's almost like oh that's the good outcome of this all so i can't believe that um and then i think another thing that kind of tied to what cody said about even if i don't know how to address that specific objection in the moment um i think it's, it's helpful to realize that your beliefs should just be a reflection of the all the evidence you've been exposed to up until today so i don't need to make a promise that like my beliefs today are going to be the same in 10 years because i don't know what evidence i'm going to get exposed to i don't know what's out there um but for me to be i would say logically compelled to be a christian it's just okay today this day in my life does the majority of evidence or the the strongest explanation for the evidence is it the truthfulness of christianity and then that is what binds me to be a christian so it's a way that I've learned to, with anxiety, with OCD, stuff like that, to still navigate not understanding everything. Um, and I totally feel sympathy for the person asking the question because, yeah, that 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 cognitive dissonance and the emotional side of it and stuff like that, it's so easy for that to be in the driver's seat. I, I might add also this quote from Lydia McGrew's article on what evidentialism is not that I, quite, I think is quite uh, poignant here. It says... Um, the point I'm making here is that evidentialism is not, never has been, and never should be an intellectual game of whack-a-mole. 
It is not a matter of trudging through a landscape of endless objections, answering one and then plodding on to tackle another. And if that is what students think it is, then the sooner they are disabused of this notion, the better. Rather, they should be encouraged to lift up their heads and see the landscape at large. They should be taken up to a mountaintop and shown the lie of the land. They should come to see the objections and replies they already know as part of a pattern so that they can fit objections they encounter into the pattern. This will be immeasurably strengthening to their faith. Um, so I think it's a really good way of expressing some of the things that we've been discussing. Hmm. I'd love to connect this with a, a second question we have that I think addresses it in a similar way. They say, I feel overwhelmed by the sheer number of objections to Christianity. The area of Bible contradictions alone is literally in the hundreds, at least, and each objection can take a while to answer. Must I know the answer to all in order to reasonably believe the gospel? And should the skeptic reasonably be expecting anyone to answer every single one of them? So I think a lot of what we've said with the fallacy of objections applies, but I wanted to open this up to maybe specifically the issue of Bible contradictions. If Cody, you want to start us off with anything you might want to add there? Oh, I, I honestly, I think a lot. I, I think kind of the main thing I said about the the moon landing conspiracy theory thing, I think would apply there, right? It's the idea that, I mean, Obviously, in that case, you're not talking about a contradiction, quote unquote, but it's a similar principle, right? It's, you know, all these objections or things people will point to that you may not know in the moment how to answer. But, you know, again, you weigh that against the positive evidence that you do uh, have. And I think that, you know, in that case, just kind of can overwhelm the, or at least not give you license to just change your belief right there in the moment because you don't have an answer at that particular point. Right. And I, I completely agree with what Cody said. And I would add to that 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 uh, alleged discrepancies or contradictions, even if actual discrepancies or contradictions are are of much less evidential value in disconfirming the general reliability of the Gospels than uh, the positive lines of argument are in confirming the general reliability of the Gospels. Because when we calibrate our expectations by looking at other uh, ancient sources, uh, even ancient sources that are uh, generally recognized as being reliable, uh, we find that sort of variation in witness testimony uh, all the time, uh, it, both in ancient sources as well as modern. And so um, since, since, since um, calibrating our expectations in that way leads us to predict that we'll find that sort of variation in eyewitness testimony, the fact that we do in fact find it in the Gospels shouldn't it can't be taken as a particularly strong evidence against the reliability of the gospels of the grounding and eyewitness testimony and um, whereas the source of evidence is that we do find that confirm and establish the gospels as eyewitness testimony and their robust reliability such as undesigned coincidences extra biblical confirmations uh, um, artless similarities and so forth unexplained illusions these things are far less expected on the hypothesis of historical fiction. And so there's a there's an epistemic asymmetry at that point. Uh, and, and so um, I, I think it, that's, that's important to bear in mind that even supposing that there are a small handful of minor good faith mistakes in the gospels, that doesn't detract from the case for robust gospel reliability, which is the foundation for the arguments for the resurrection, uh, the trilemma, the argument for messianic prophecy, uh, the conversion of Paul and so forth. Mm. David, did you have anything? Yeah, two have? things come two things come to mind. Number one, I, you know, this is in many ways, I think, like the kind of arguments that are advanced when someone genuinely doesn't want to believe, wants to find an excuse of some sort. And so I think it's worth calling people out. You know, someone who says, oh, no, I'm an atheist. Well, I want to call them out and find out why. Why do you hold that view? What is your evidence for that position? And similarly, I, mean, I don't know what the rest of you think about this, but when someone says, well, I mean, think of all the contradictions in the Bible. Well, Jonathan's referred to one or two little areas that, you know, might be good faith mistakes in recording the narrative or whatever, but actual contradictions. Let's hear them. Which ones are causing you concern? Uh, it's quite interesting, I think, just the psychology behind this, because I remember listening recently to a talk by Gabby, Gary Habermas on the resurrection. And he presented the, the sort of minimal facts case that he likes to champion for the resurrection. And in so doing, he really laid out a case that was very convincing. And having done that, he was asked the question, well, so why in the face of all this evidence, 
do people just decide that they will not accept it? And his answer was interesting. He said, well, people will only believe what they want to believe. And I think there's an element of psychological reality in that response, to be honest. So I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't beat up ourselves too much over some of these issues for which we might feel slightly vulnerable when the reality is that the weight of evidence is very heavily in favour of the accuracy of scripture. Uh, one thing, I, Jonathan, I'd love to get your specific take on, and then Cody and David, you could jump in with other thoughts on this as well. I, I imagine that the person asking this could maybe feel pressure as well with encountering any sort of contradictions because I think especially in the modern times, it's either like the two loudest perspectives are the Bible's completely unreliable or, oh, every single word, dot and iota is inspired by God verbally. So if there's any kind of error, the whole thing goes out, kind of like similar to like a Quran or something like that. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think or maybe advice you would give to this person on how to think differently in terms of grasping the reliability of specific parts of the Bible and maybe just a new way to think about that. Yeah, I mean, the, the Bible is not the Christian equivalent of the Quran, right? The M Muslims have a very different understanding of inspiration than Christians do. For the Muslim, the Quran is supposed to have been delivered piecemeal by the angel Jibril or Gabriel over a 23-year period between the end of 609 AD in 632 when Muhammad died and uh, the Quran is dictated by Allah through the uh, agency of the angel Gabriel and uh, uh, by contrast though the, the biblical text we don't believe is dictated for the most part by God rather uh, God inspires the scriptures Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 16 17 all scripture is theopnevstos or God breathed uh, and what exactly that means no one's really quite sure there's different theories of inspiration and so forth I, I tend to think that God um, as, uh, appoints uh, apostles and prophets uh, and imparts to them special revelatory insights that he then entrusts them to uh, express in their own voice and that's what you see in the biblical text uh, there's overwhelming evidence against dictation dictational theories of inspiration for example uh, different authors have a preference for different words mark for example loves to use the word immediately he uses it all the time uh, another um, problem with that uh, perspective on inspiration is that so in in first corinthians one uh, Paul records a memory lapse. I don't recall if I baptized anyone else. Um, you've also got an interjection by Paul's scribe in uh, Romans 16, 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. So it, it doesn't look like scripture is being dictated for the most part by God. Um, I, I think I, I view the Gospels and Acts and other historical records in the, Bi in the Bible as historical records that... Um, that uh, pertain to the history of Israel and the the incarnation of Christ and the history of the early church and so forth in the case of Acts. And not all hypothesized errors in those sources are epistemically equivalent. There are some that are of higher stakes than others. So I do draw a distinction, for example, between a minor good faith mistake versus a deliberate distortion of fact. A successful demonstration of the latter would be of much more grave consequence than a successful demonstration that there is a few minor good faith mistakes as a result in variation in eyewitness memory or something along those lines. So I, I do think that inerrancy is a high stakes issue. I do, however, think that there is a high stakes issue in the vicinity, which is the strong reliability of scripture. And so I, I affirm the strong reliability of scripture, even though I, I don't necessarily affirm the a kind of a strong inerrantist perspective. Um, Cody or David, anything to, to say there? No, I think I, I would be inclined to go along with that. I think uh, if you try and argue for absolute inerrancy, you'll find yourself coming coming into difficulty from time to time because there are some things that just look as if they may actually not quite square with that. I think it's reasonable, however, to say that the Bible is inerrant in everything that it seeks to teach. Uh, and so while there might be the occasional wrinkle in terms of the text and the way the text has been prepared and I think nevertheless the overall message is is absolutely reliable yeah all, all I really yeah I don't really have much to add to that except to yeah point out the fact that inerrancy is a more low stakes issue though which though I think the problem is I think some people 
maybe without realizing it and almost have that a little too ingrained to them, this idea that, oh, well, no inerrancy is, if, if there is something wrong, well, then it kind of unravels the whole thing. And I'd say that's the biggest thing people kind of need to, to get away from. And I say this though, as I myself do consider myself an inerrantist, but again, I recognize it's, it's reliability is the real high stakes issue, not inerrancy. There can be minor errors, um, which is why when it, which is why tying into the point about contradictions, right? Uh, whether or not a con an actual contradiction would be damaging does depend on the nature of the contradiction. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's a much bigger deal if Luke actually did get, you know, the census wrong, right? That would be a bigger deal if that if he made that error as opposed to um, whether John, uh, you know, got the was off by like one hour about when Jesus was crucified, right? Like those two things are not kind of, are not in the same boat. Mm. Yeah, I would say specifically just for doubters too like are people kind of walking through this crisis and just looking for just trying to function in it the thing i would say too is it's like knowing the reliability of the gospel accounts and even like the epistles and stuff like that through the apostolic authority i think you can come to believe in that and then that can kind of give you some peace give you some assurance that you're in the right place while you're learning about inspiration theories and how it all fixes and stuff like that like i i do i do think it's it's easy for us in the modern age where everyone's got their leather bound esv study bible to think all right i got to believe every word in this thing and then i can function as a christian and it's like okay no if i'm persuaded by the gospel and i think it's a reliable account i can jump into that and be a jesus follower and then i'm figuring out the other ends as i'm in it so that that's something i would give to someone that's maybe walking this crisis out right now Absolutely. Um, and one, one, one other point there is that, um, and, and I, I completely agree with, with that, people ought to uh, study the, the positive case for Christianity, and then that provides them with a robust uh, foundation. And then uh, from that, uh, once they have laid that foundation, then go and explore the objections in the negative case. Eric Manning had a great video on his channel on why uh, people ought to stop um, digesting um, uh, atheist YouTubers like Apologia and uh, Myth Vision and so forth. Uh, I mean, we're not saying don't go and listen to them, but we're saying that you sh but you shouldn't just go and watch these atheist YouTubers without any foundational knowledge of the positive case for Christianity. A lot of people who are doubting their faith or who have left Christianity, I, I um, will, will tell me that they've done this long and deep investigation to the evidence for Christianity and have concluded that Christianity is false. And I'll ask them. Well, can you, if I were to give you, say, two or three minutes to give me your best steel man case for Christianity, I mean, you've done all this research. I mean, how would you go about doing that? And I've been quite surprised at how few people who claim to be in that position actually can give you a, a robust, you know, steel man case for Christianity. Um, and that suggests to me that people will go and look at the objections to Christianity, the negative case, but they have no foundation of what the positive case is. And so they're completely blindsided by those negative critiques without being able to contextualize it within th that broader framework. Yeah. Totally. Love it. Um, so this next question we have, I want to preface it because they included it at the end, but I think it's important for understanding the rest of the question that this is coming from an ex-Christian agnostic. So what are your guys' thoughts about freedom from religion and street epistemology organizations? I've been with each, but don't feel like I'm getting either the emotional or intellectual support I need regarding the biggest questions of life. Should someone like me who's ex-Christian agnostic continue with them? I started it off with the ex-Christian thing because I read it as a Christian the whole time and then got M. Night Shyamalan at the end. So I think it makes sense to hear it at the beginning. I think they might be referring to Recovering from Religion Foundation, which is uh, the organization that is kind of, in some ways, atheist equivalent of what we're doing, except I think that they offer more in terms of emotional support than intellectual engagement. Uh, Mackenzie, I think, is in, in the audience uh, this evening uh, or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world, I guess. Mackenzie, who's in the audience, is has... has been involved with uh, Recovering from Religion Foundation. So she might have more insight on to um, what it's like to do calls with them. But um, I, I get the sense from my limited perspective that they tend to be more, uh, they tend to have a very derisive attitude towards religious belief and, and Christianity in particular. Um, 
and I, I don't think that they, they do a lot in terms of an intellectual engagement with, with the best arguments for Christianity the same way that we do with the best arguments against it. Um, Cody or David, I don't know if you've had any interaction with these organizations and if you have anything to contribute there. Not really. I mean, I, I think the only the sort of person who comes to mind there is who was uh, rhetorically best at having a go at the Christian position would be Christopher Hitchens, I reckon, the late Christopher Hitchens who always thought that, uh, or at least claimed to think that much of the Christian position was just absurd and drawn from the mythology of paganism and barbarism and so on. But it was more, it was more a name calling exercise than anything that was really substantive, I think. But I have no experience of these organizations or online services that you refer to. Uh, if Cody doesn't have anything to share there, the thing I would just say is, um, and this, this isn't speaking specifically to those two organizations, I would just say this about any organization you're involved with on these, is having that proper intellectual and emotional support. What, what I learned through my crisis is like, you almost don't know what you need when you start one of these crises. Like I was thinking about it way differently at the beginning before the end. Like it was really understanding probabilities and cumulative cases and stuff like that, that really helped me walk through that. But I wasn't looking for those. I didn't know those. It wasn't until I got connected with Jonathan who had, been in this space, um, had had a lot of these interactions and stuff like that. So the, the encouragement I would give to the asker is take a look at what they're doing in terms of interacting with outsiders. Um, and then as well as just like the general kind of tone, um, because I think if you get in one of these more, uh, I would say like harsher organizations where maybe it's a lot of trash talking or whatever, I think it's totally normal to not feel like you can get the emotional support there. Cause it's like, okay, if they're dogging on everyone, like, why would I bring my vulnerabilities to them, you know? Um, and then same thing with them interacting with outside perspectives and stuff like that. Uh, I think if if they're less open to that, um, there's a chance, uh, that's a good indicator that maybe you're not getting the same kind of intellectual feeding. So, and again, with organizations too, you're going to have a bunch of different individuals involved and each of them are going to have different attitudes. Some of them will be better than others with the intellectual and emotional side. So, it, it's complicated. You got to kind of work it through, but I think there are some indicators you can look at for that, for sure. All righty. So that's all the Discord ones we have right now. So hopping into the chat that we have submitted, uh, Caleb asked, what are some ways to get people to actually care about engaging with the religious topics from a rational, intellectual angle? Uh, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on the panel, both if you're engaging with, let's say, a non-Christian who just doesn't seem to care about it, or a Christian who doesn't seem to care about the arguments and stuff. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on both. Uh, David, do you want to start us off on this one? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, I think. Uh, my experience of that is that when you hold an event of some sort, and we've had some experience of running various events that have looked at the issue of the design hypothesis in nature, for example, and we wondered, you know, are we going to get any buy-in? Is there much interest out there in this whole question of where we've come from? You know, the big issue is the ultimate realities of life. And the answer <coughs> always surprised us in the sense that when we have launched an event of some sort, even an in-person event, where we've hired a venue and we've put out some advertisements and we've invited people to come, we have been heavily oversubscribed. And the same thing applies in the online uh, area as well. So I'm not quite sure what Caleb is getting at here. So maybe on a one-to-one -one level, he's thinking about a friend who he just can't seem to get on topic. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, other than just taking a kind of broad brush, you know, both barrels approach and, and raising the topic. I mean, people will often be able and willing to speak about uh, issues concerning belief and so on, often in a dismissive way. But if they dismiss it, then you've got an angle to go on, you know? Why do you take that view? Is, uh, you know, sim ask the simple, as we call them in Scotland, the daft laddie question. You know, just uh, keep it very straightforward and simple and just challenge the position that they appear to take. Mm -hmm. Why don't they care? This is something that could, if it's correct, influence your eternal destiny. Don't you think that's important? You know, who knows? It's it's difficult. It's going to be difficult for different for uh, for each individual, I suppose. But uh, yeah, it's not an easy one. Tim McGrew was speaking at a conference uh, a couple a few years, few years ago, and uh, he put out a promo video advertising the conference on the reliability of the Gospels. And the promo video was him uh, role playing as an atheist professor, giving all of these uh, objections 
historical objections to the Gospels. Um, but at the end of the video, he didn't give any any responses to those uh, objections to the Gospels. He said, if you want to know the, <laughs> know the answers to those objections that you just heard, then you better come to the conference. And so giving, giving people like some of the objections that they might hear from critical scholarship, I think can um, motivate them to get interested and get uh, engaging with these topics because uh, people um, want to have answers. Um, they, they don't realize how much they need a robust uh, foundation in apologetics before they realize uh, or hear what the, uh, some of the objections are that they might encounter. Mm. Cody, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I think the main thing, I, I'm thinking specifically more about like a non-Christian who's kind of just apathetic about it all. Mm. Like I, I do think asking questions is, is a good general principle. I say general because again, people are different. So it's largely going to depend on the individual in question, but asking questions is a good thing. Like, like David was saying, like, well, why, why do you not care? Um, things like that. Um, I also find maybe it can be helpful to almost um, kind of, because I, I know William Lane Craig, like, you know, talks about you know, what the, the absurdity of life without God, he has that whole talk and everything, which you know, gets from a lot of existentialist philosophers. And I, I find that can actually be surprisingly effective at getting people to think about it when you start pondering, you know, our mortality and what, you know, where, what's all going to, what, you know, death and what's all going to happen to everybody at the end of their life. I mean, it can be amazing how things like that can almost get people to start thinking <laughs> more about this stuff um but again it's going to depend on the person right it's like you can almost ask like i mean you know what what do you think happens after you die what happens to your loved ones after you die um mm. so because i mean everybody has to face that sooner or later nobody can be <clears throat> apathetic about that at least not for long mm. yeah i uh i think there's a, a few things at play here um one i think of a, a principle that blaise pascal laid out where he talked about we have to show that christianity is not just true, but we have to show that it is desirable and good as well. Uh, and in my experience, it's not always the truth one that gets people. I think uh, in our community, we'll talk about doubts. I think we're all a little bit more inclined towards that truth one being the hook that grabs us. Um, but I've seen plenty of other stories as well where it's it's the goodness that links people in and then the truth and uh, desirableness are kind of other things that come together with them but it's i think all of us end up valuing all three of them in our decision to adhere to a belief system because um th this is something i've talked about where like yeah at the end of the day if islam was true like i wouldn't adhere to it but islam just is not as desirable as christianity and i'm not saying that that should affect like our epistemic bars or things like that um, but i think it's more just recognizing the human condition and how we're not just reacting intellectually we're reacting emotionally as well and that we just got to think about how we're impacting people on that i also think that people just have different impressions of christianity um so i think a lot of the people especially um i think about in the west today a lot of people just see christian as kind of something nominal it's something pluralist um so it's not a super hard line in the sand so they don't really feel pressure to evaluate it um just where we are kind of in this pressure this uh, society where it's it's weird to put pressure on someone's belief system or try and hunt for the truth and say there's one correct way or something like that and i think that structure makes it it difficult for people to kind of naturally have this propensity towards all right let me look for the one true perspective you know i say that as someone who for the first 17 years of my life didn't care about it or actually first like probably 18 19 years i didn't care about it um and then finally, I would add is just that there are some people that are different. Like I have a friend of mine who believes Christianity is true, but kind of chooses not to follow it. And like, I can't relate to that, um, but you're going to encounter people like that. So it's, it honestly is in those conversations, you just got to ask the good questions, get a good scope of where they're at holistically, not just intellectually, emotionally. Um, and everyone's just going to kind of have unique reactions from there. So let's get to our next question. <clears throat> uh, Anna asks, in response to why a good God would allow animal suffering, some people say that animals cannot feel pain the way humans do. Do you think it is accurate that animals cannot feel pain the way we do? Uh, this isn't an area that I've done a lot of research on. I, I, I'm skeptical of that claim. Uh, David, do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something? You yeah, well, I can speak with some authority. I've been inflicting pain on people for most of my life. Um, 
you know, I think uh, there's there's a huge issue in relation to understanding pain. Pain as a human is experienced in different ways. So you can apply a pain stimulus. And I can tell you a number of stories about some experimental work we did on pain with a standard stimulus. And some people were able to tolerate the standard stimulus and others weren't. And of course, there's a huge psychological overlay there. Now, in terms of animal pain, we've got no real insight on that. All, all you could really say is that pain perception and bear in mind that perception takes it to a level beyond just the physical stimulus. But pain perception, uh, from a psychological point of view, is likely to be somewhat different. It's not likely to be uh, overlaid with the same measure of concern about the future, about anxiety, and so on. We don't know about animal anxiety. We don't know about animal appreciation of anything beyond the present. But it seems unlikely that they have anything like the same developed understanding and psychological concerns that humans have. And so it's likely that pain is going to be different. Do animals suffer pain? Undoubtedly, they suffer pain. I mean, that's demonstrably obvious that animals suffer pain. So I'm not sure that there's therefore a fundamental difference between suffering pain and suffering pain as we do in relation to the origin of this particular question. So it still throws back the response, well, why would a good God allow any kind of suffering. And of course, well, you've probably visited that one in a number of different ways in a number of different settings, but it's one of the more difficult questions for Christians to engage with, especially with a, a skeptical audience. I, I had a neighbor of where Jonathan used to live just discussing this with me yesterday and saying that, uh, you know, in Britain, you probably didn't catch this in the US news, but there was a, a tragedy in England in the last few days where four young boys were playing on a frozen lake, on a, a lake that was never normally frozen, and they were out on the ice. And uh, one of them got stuck, and the other three went to the to the assistance of this individual, and, and all of them ended up in the water, in the icy water. And emergency services were called, they got them out, all of them had cardiac arrests, they finally got into hospital, tried to resuscitate them, all four ultimately died. And his question to me, well, you know, where was your God in that situation? How can you explain to those parents, you know, that there's a loving God when that kind of thing can happen and happen regularly, it seems, in our world. And of course, that's just one example of many that you could think of. But it is a, it is a, a difficult problem. As to the differentiation between humans and animals, I'm not sure that I'd want to get into that in too much depth, to be honest. Mm. Uh, I, I, I do know that Michael Murray wrote a book called Nature, Red Tooth and Claw, I think it's called. Um, been a while since I've looked at that question though but I because I know William Lane Craig has talked about that book as well where I think he kind of makes an argument there's different levels of awareness of pain that animals have uh that I think he tries to say something to the effect of like how like they feel pain but they're not aware that they're in pain the way humans are but I can't assess that's, how accurate it, that is I'm just saying it, 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 it is highly controversial though yeah. so that that's not something that's widely agreed upon and right. uh and I mean it certainly seems to be the case that trivially that some animals have a much lower um, perception of pain than we do so for example i don't think that um insects um have the same pain uh capacity as we do or a capacity for sensing pain um or, or some some other lower forms of life uh, perhaps birds for example have very small brains uh, but uh, but there are uh, or even um, mice and rats um but i i think that the closer you get to humans such as chimpanzees or other primates i mean it seems to me that there would be an argument from analogy that would provide a prima facie basis for thinking that probably they have a similar pain perception to what we do um would you would you agree with that david is, is that oh, i think that's right i don't think you yeah. could ever really know Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can you can make assumptions based on the degree of sophistication in an insect nervous system as compared with a mammalian nervous system, for example. But, uh, you know, it would be purely suppositional. I think with good reason, you could make some kind of inference to that to that end. But in terms of really establishing a difference and, and a difference, you know, so so take the difference between human suffering and primate suffering, for example or other primates, as some people might want to design it. Uh, I think you'd be on very difficult ground to try and really draw a distinction. On, on what basis would you make that distinction? You know, it would be supposition. It would be 
inference rather than anything absolutely empirical. Mm. So what's behind the question? Though? That's that's what interests me, you know, so. I, th I think what's behind the question is the problem of animal suffering, right? Which is, as you said, I think one of the most difficult uh, objections to Christianity to to address, um, because with with human suffering, you can appeal to um, things like, well, God wants to mold our character and and so forth. There are theodicies that are much more available when it comes to human suffering. But with yeah. respect to animal suffering, some of the theodicies that have some mileage with respect to humans lose their yeah they do. Uh, value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Caleb also recommended in the chat <clears throat> Trent Doherty's book, Constructing a Theodicy for Animal Pain. Um, right. But, and then it, Jonathan, it looks like you nailed what was behind the question. Uh, so good, good detective work on that. I'm just kidding. Uh, I do want to encourage everyone watching to get some more questions in, in the chat if you have them. We have uh, one more question from Mackenzie that we got right now, and then I have a couple more I can ask. But uh, if you guys have any questions, please get those in. Um, <clears throat> So Mackenzie asks, question for the panel. It seems to me that a central component to Christianity is that salvation is a choice we make, that we choose to believe that Jesus died for our sins and that the Christian framework of creation and salvation is correct. Are beliefs a choice, though? In my pondering this matter, I've come to define beliefs as conclusions we inevitably draw from our perceptions of reality. For example, think of something you don't believe and think of what it would take for you to change your mind about it. It would take reasons and evidence for that thing not simply your will to believe it. Do you guys have any thoughts on this apparent difference between Christianity treating belief as a choice, but belief seeming to not be a choice kind of matter? Uh, Cody, you want to start us off on that one? That's, yeah, well, that's, that's a complicated one. Um, I think, I really think it depends on the belief in question, right? Like there's some, there's, there's a lot of beliefs of mine that I guess you could say in one sense, I don't really I can't really choose, right? Like the common example, right? I look and I see that the sky is blue, right? Could I just suddenly choose and will myself to believe that the sky is green? I mean, I know I probably couldn't do that. Um, but then there are other types of beliefs that um, maybe aren't, aren't quite as obvious that, you know, one could almost like, you know, I'm, I'm struggling off the top of my head to think of an example, though. But, the, yeah, people like there's self-deception or people kind of they want a certain belief to be true. And so they just kind of like, you know almost in a way kind of will themselves to believe one way, maybe by ignoring evidence against it, you know, the, the, those, those types of acts, right? Mm -hmm. um, I do remember also, because um, every time I hear this, I think of this example, there was this video interview I saw with N.T. Wright once where he talks about how he, um, how he was talking to somebody about his argument that he made for the resurrection of Christianity and how the guy, according to N.T. Wright, the guy said to him, like, yeah, you've really nailed the argument down. It's very convincing. I just simply choose not to believe until a better explanation can come along. Um, funny enough, I actually told that to an atheist friend of mine. And the guy, the atheist just said, no, I think that guy was just lying when he said that. It's like, I mean, okay, maybe he was. But uh, like, yeah, I, 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 I guess it's hard to answer. It really depends on the belief in question, I suppose. I, I suspect the other panelists may have more concrete examples than what I'm thinking of at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I definitely have thoughts, but I want to defer to Jonathan and, and David first. David, do you want to go first? or? Well, I just, I, I would hark back to the point I made earlier about, about the quote from Habermas, you know, people will, despite the evidence being absolutely convincing, will only believe things that they want to believe. So there's always going to be an element of choice. And it may be that there's an underlying implication, which is built into the belief. If you believe something, that implies something necessarily quite important that may reflect on your lifestyle or may make demands on your character that you're not prepared to accept. And so for that reason, you shy away from from the belief, even although the evidence is is persuasive and convincing. So, yeah, I think I think there is an element of choice for sure, uh, but it's not just choice. I mean, I think, for example, you know, <laughs> there are lots of things that we're perfectly rational to believe, even although there is no evidence for it. So, you know, the the reality for aesthetic value and beauty, for example, the the importance of justice and fairness and, and ethical value, even 
basic metaphysical claims. You know, there's no there's no rational evidential basis for many of these things, and yet it's perfectly rational to believe them and accept them. Uh, where it actually has an impact on what's likely to happen in your life and make claims on your behavior, that's when it becomes difficult for people. Mm -hmm. No, there, there is such a thing as cognitive dissonance, uh, and that, of course, implies that there is an element of choice when it comes to uh, our beliefs. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, David and I are both very much involved in the intelligent design community, and it's not uncommon for us to hear after having presented uh, overwhelming evidence from the life sciences uh, for the reality of design in nature, for a, a skeptic to push back and say, well, Maybe when I mean, you just give us, you know, 50 years and we'll come up with um, with uh, an alternative explanation. Uh, well, OK, maybe, but in no other field of inquiry, no other academic field do we do this where we we uh, refuse to accept the best explanation because, well, let's just wait and find a better explanation that that comports with what we want to be true in the first place. I mean, that's just bad methodology. So um yeah, there there is of course an element where you have to be persuaded. I mean, I can't I can't just um, will myself to believe that there's a pink elephant in the room because I just don't believe that because I haven't seen the evidence. But there's also of course an element of choice when it comes to beliefs as well. So it's it's not an either or. It's more of a both end there. I think it also um, you know comes to that element of choice, right? It also shows how selective people can be on how they evaluate evidence. I think I remember David Wood was once talking about how. He points out how you notice that like skeptics, right, when it comes to like certain claims, like religious claims, you know, they tend to just dial up their skepticism, whether it's for Christianity or even if I've even seen this when you try to show skeptics like modern day miracles, right, how they just suddenly get super skeptical about these particular claims. But then there are other claims, right, that might have even less evidence for them that you may notice that, well, suddenly they're not so skeptical about that. And I think the way people will do that kind of like double standard evaluations kind of shows, in, at least in some sense, an element of choice because, you know, one thing maybe contradicts their preconceived conclusions, like what Jonathan was saying, right? And so they just deliberately will become more skeptical of it so that they don't have to believe whatever the thing is in question. Mm. I, uh, I'd i love to uh, maybe talk about a different part of it, uh, Mackenzie, is the idea that um, our, our salvation comes from a choice to believe. I think that we frame it a lot this way in the church in the West, but I think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, I, I think this is kind of a consequence of us moving away from actually arguing for the truthfulness of Christianity and instead maybe pushing more on, oh, like living this way has really changed my life and the kind of arguing more as like an ethical system. Um, but I, I think when we look at the biblical text in the New Testament, I think it's a very different posture. And the first thing I would say is I think of like James 2, where it talks about even the, even the demons believe and they shudder. Um, so if the demons believe and they've, we could say, made the choice or made the choice not to believe or whatever, that's not what's separating them from Jesus's followers. I think there is a, a choosing to be saved, not in the sense that I'm, I'm choosing to believe that I'm compelled by this evidence or something like that. I do think there's something to what you're saying there. And in my opinion that, yeah, our beliefs are just kind of a reflection of the evidence we've been exposed to. I agree with what Cody said, where we can kind of affected a little bit either emotionally subconsciously or consciously how well we take that evidence into account but i do agree with your general statement of yeah our beliefs are kind of something we something we absorb from observing things um but all over the new testament we see people that believe jesus is the messiah or believe uh jesus is like the one under which we are saved and still turn away so i think of like the rich young ruler that approaches jesus um his issue moving away, he didn't go at the end like, ah, oh, you're not really the Messiah and walks off. It was that like he wasn't willing to follow Jesus. Um, I also think of like Judas and uh, people like that. So I, I do think it's more complicated than just, oh, we choose to believe that Jesus is the Messiah um, and then bam, we're saved, we're good to go. I think, okay, we recognize he's the Messiah, but if we don't follow after him and become his disciple, it's not true faith. Um, and I know that gets into this whole conversation on works and stuff like that. I'm not saying we earn our salvation or anything like that. Um, but I do think truly being a disciple of Jesus, truly being one of the citizens of the kingdom means you're trusting him actively in your actions. Um, and I, I think that's an important component here that we have kind of lost sight of a little bit. Uh, next question we have, 
are there individuals, uh, parentheses, particular, particular atheists or agnostics, but can extend to other religions, who are sincere, knowledgeable, and genuinely seeking truth, but never land on Christianity? If so, how do you account for that on a Christian worldview? Also, Mackenzie, I'm happy to come around and address that first uh, in a second. But uh, let's let's go with that question that I just read off. So, so I, I I don't deny the existence of non-resistant non-believers, uh, to use John Schellenberg's phrase. Uh, I am more skeptical, though, of the existence of long-term non-resistant non-believers. So I, it may well be the case that someone is a non-resistant non-believer at time T, but my position is that that individual will either stop being a non-resistant non-believer and start being a resistant non-believer, or they will find they will come to find Christianity to be true and well supported and become a Christian. So um, I'm I, I'm convinced of the goodness of God by virtue of the arguments bearing on Christianity, the resurrection, among other arguments. And that being the case, that provides me with a basis on which to think that God will reveal himself to those who are truly seeking him. And, uh, and that might be through whatever means, uh, through uh, inquiry into the public evidences or in s some parts of the world, uh, perhaps uh, through dreams and visions. Uh, that seems to be something that's prevalent in the Muslim world, for example, where people have less access to the gospel. Now, you might wonder about what 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 about the Amazonian tribesmen, right? The, the person is, just doesn't have access to to missionaries and the bible and so forth and there I, I think we just have to trust god's goodness that he will have some morally just arrangement for such individuals uh perhaps he appropriates the value of christ's death to them uh and or perhaps he um holds them accountable for the information they do have uh based on their uh, on natural theology uh etc or perhaps he reveals himself to them in some other special way through dreams and visions or through some sort of miraculous event we, we just don't know these are all speculations of course but given that we have independent reason to think that god is good that provides us with a, a prima facie basis on which to think that god has some morally just arrangement for such people even if we don't know what that is um yeah. any, anyone else have any comments there no that's a good answer okay cool um well i want to do one last call for questions if you guys have anything uh, get it in, uh, and then I will. I want to respond to Mackenzie's uh, quoting of Romans ten thirteen or Romans ten nine as well. Um, I'm going to preface by saying that my my response to this is not like a totally flushed out exegesis of Romans. Uh, I don't have that flushed out well enough. I haven't studied it well enough. Um, but what I would argue from is the that passage that I referenced in James talking about. Okay, like the the sincerity of works in validating faith. Um, I do think that that's really crucial and a big part of this picture, but I think it also comes from our modern understanding of belief and what that means uh, or faith and comparing it to what it meant in the ancient world. So based on what, actually what I see in the church nowadays is we almost treat believing in Jesus as like checking intellectual box. It's just an intellectual assent to certain facts and I can kind of keep going. Uh, but if I like, if I will, um like agree with a certain creed or something like that it's like bam i believe uh but from what i've seen in exposure with like studies of the ancient world belief is much more of a holistic concept to them um when we when you believe in something it inevitably impacts your actions um inevitably impacts the choices that you're making in your behavior um and i, I think all christian traditions would assert this in one effect to another um, but I bring this to Romans 10, 9 and saying that we believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is not just choosing to believe in that fact that he raised from the dead. Again, we've talked about how your beliefs are kind of something that are impressed on you from exposure to the evidence. There's a big asterisk on that, but I'll say that. Um, it's not just the intellectual assent to Jesus's resurrection. It's living consequentially in light of that. Um, and again, you're getting into debates of if you can lose your salvation or not, what works, what role do works play or things like that. All I'm trying to put forward is that it's not as simple as just asserting a certain statement. It's not as simple as easy believism or something like that. So I don't think at the end of the day, how you get your salvation in Christianity is just that intellectual assent. Um, 
I think if that was the case, we wouldn't have all these passages from Jesus talking about what it takes to be his disciple. Because uh, at that at that point, he would just be like, hey, like if you think I'm the Messiah uh, and you think that my father raises me, you're good to go. I'll see you at the end of this all. No, he, he very much cares about the life we're living today and what it means to be under his lordship as ruler of his kingdom. And I, I think that inevitably factors into this. Justin, don't you think that's exactly what that verse is saying, though? I mean, you say you don't do a full exegesis of it, but that is, you know, you're believing in your heart. Mm. That is not believing in your mind. This is not just mind. This is mm. this is following the Lord, loving the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That mm. is the sense of that, I think. And so, mm. so when you put it in those terms, then... It's pretty straightforward, I think, and it's a good quote. I think uh, Mackenzie has done well to remind us of that. Mm. Cool. Sweet. All righty. Uh, what is the next question? All right, Anna's got sometimes an explanation for an apparent discrepancy. Also, really quick, Mackenzie, if you don't feel like uh, that question's kind of adequately answered in that, always happy to chat more. Also, if I'm misunderstanding what David said, and that was actually an objection to what I was saying, uh, let me know there as well. But I thought we were in no, agreement on it, but yeah. No, we agreed. We're agreed. Just an amplification. Okay. Really. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I didn't know if you were then kind of arguing back on it. I just want to clarify that up. Um, okay. Anna's question. Sometimes an explanation for an apparent discrepancy in the Bible seems very complex. Why should we prefer the complicated explanation that resolves the discrepancy over the more simple explanation that it truly is a contradiction? Um, one principle I'd love to lay out in this is, I'm going to, I want to answer this one first. Um, the, there's a principle that I've been thinking about a lot lately that I think works with our probabilities and it's letting the majority inform the minority. Um, I think that's a really crucial principle when you hit something like a biblical contradiction where, um, we have this vast amount of evidence that just say the gospel accounts are really reliable. It is not wrong for me to have an explanation at the end of this that relies on that to say, yeah, I can't fully explain this contradiction, but I have such compelling evidence that this is eyewitness knowledgeable accounts. I can have faith that there's, there's something going on here, whether it's a good faith mistake, whether it's I don't fully understand the context or whatever to understand what's going on. I think we can let the majority of evidence inform the minority to form our full belief system. And I don't think that it becomes special pleading or just writing off an objection or something like that. Um, but Jonathan, love to jump yeah, in on that one. I, I completely agree. Um, I, I I do think, by the way, that harmonization is a valid histor historiographical practice, and that it should be encouraged. Uh, unfortunately, there's a tendency among many critical scholars to be very dismissive of the project of harmonization, and I think that that is unhelpful. Uh, I I think that when when you have multiple sources that overlap concerning an event then why not allow them to illuminate one another? I mean, this is what happens in the real world. People have slightly different um, versions of events and they I, actually, the way that they fit together can sometimes be taken as positive evidence for the reliability of the gospel accounts. Uh, this is what uh, the Reverend T.R. Burks called uh, reconcilable variations. It actually, um, when you see accounts that apparently at first blush seem to be in tension with one another, and then upon learning some new information or inspecting the text a bit more carefully, they actually they actually fit together without strain after all, you have evidence of independent accounts that dovetail, and that actually supports historicity rather than detracting from it. Um, but I, I think that it's quite legitimate to use real-world imagination to um, hypothesize harmonizations, in particular when the sources have been shown time and again to be otherwise very strongly reliable, and that provides a prima facie basis on which to trust them, even with those details that uh, are um, initially suspect. Anything to, to add there, Cody or David? No. Um, not a whole lot, other except I guess maybe I could also just add, I, I know something Lydia likes to point out is that uh, she says like real life is like a moving picture, right? I think the idea being that real life isn't always super simple anyway. Like sometimes there's just a multifaceted layer to an event, especially when we're dealing with witness testimony, uh, talking about the same event, right? But they talk about it in different ways. I mean, why should we expect that 
Uh, I mean, it doesn't seem to me like simplicity should be is like the be all end all criteria for what counts as a good explanation. Sometimes real life can be complicated. <laughs> complicated things happen. Hmm. Very cool. Very true. Um, all right. We'll give it a couple more minutes uh, for people to give last questions in. Uh, but I'd love to just get thoughts um, from the panelists on one question I have is uh, us heading into the Christmas season right now. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit about this in the emotional support group, but we're kind of trying to gear up and anticipate some conversations surrounding faith beliefs, uh, these really sensitive topics. And I'd love to just get your guys' insight on maybe practical tips for having meaningful but not harsh conversations about the truthfulness of Christianity or the truthfulness of other belief systems or stuff like that. And that can be good lead-ins, that can be practical tips on handling it, stuff like that. I'd love to just get your guys' tips for us heading into gathering with family and either talking about politics or religion. <laughs> well, don't be condescending, for one. Uh, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, basically just treat... Um, just take just to show that you care about what the person has to say and that you're taking what they say seriously, that you're not just being dismissive or, you know, acting like that you're somehow better than them, you know, like treat them as an equal and really listen and ask questions. And you'd be surprised at how well that can work in conversation. It makes people more open to talking, right? When they don't feel like they're being talked down to. Mm. Is that yeah, is it hard for you, Caleb? Like, though, be, because for Cody, is that hard for you because you are better than everyone? Is it hard to kind of get that mindset? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Jonathan, David, your guys' thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that's good advice. I, I think uh, take every opportunity you can. Uh, encourage people to engage with the, the Christmas story in a meaningful way. Uh, I think you can do that in all sorts of different ways. You know, the, the topic will come up almost naturally. Uh, depends on your setting, of course. If you're meeting someone in the street or meeting someone in a family gathering of some sort, then you just have to be light on your feet and be ready to use whatever seems the appropriate strategy at the time. If it's in a church setting and you've got inquirers there, then present the truth and take the challenge. You know, if they want to push back on it, then engage the conversation. But do it, do it in a way which is respectful and do it in a way which is persuasive. So know your material. I think being prepared is is a huge element of mm. of the uh, the issue here being successful in in presenting a reasonable case for for the gospel at Christmas for sure. Totally. I I, I like uh, Greg Kokel's book on having meaningful conversations. It's called Tactics. Yeah. Um, it's a good uh, game plan for sharing your faith and asking probing but respectful and cordial questions. Uh, about why people, what people, to, to ask for clarifications, so or what do you mean by that? Uh, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, have you ever considered? And asking in the form of questions, I think, is quite powerful in getting people to think through their own justification for their beliefs. Uh, and so, yeah, I recommend another, that. Yeah, I think totally. another thing worth bringing up is. Um, you know, something, something a friend of mine once said, uh, like when you're talking to somebody, if someone asks you a question or something, you don't, if you don't have the answer to something, don't pretend that you do. Like, it's okay to admit in the conversation, you know, I haven't thought about that. I don't really know, but I'd like, I could, I'd love to go look into that and I could get back to you on that particular thing. Uh, so I do worry sometimes, you know, in the apologetics community, we kind of get so used to like, you know, having the answers for everything. Right. And I think it can become hard for a lot of people to, you know, to come across something they don't really know and so they may try to act like they have an answer they'll try to just come up with a half-baked answer on the spot and i would just encourage people don't do that uh mm -hmm. it's okay to to not know everything and to admit right there that you don't really know um but that you're willing to look into it more and you can get back to the person on that mm -hmm. yeah i i totally agree with cody there where that can even become an opportunity where it's like let's look into that together or something like that and it is not only addressing that specific issue, but it's maybe establishing this rhythm of you guys getting to dive into stuff like that together. Um, and then the, I think the final thought I have with it too, after listening with you guys is just that as a Christian, like you have a few different ways to bring the focus on that. So I think one, the way you approach the Christmas season is gonna really impact that. Um, I think you have the ability to show like what's important to you at Christmas time, what you're celebrating, what the meaning of this all is. Um, and I think that's something you have a, a really strong potential to do. But then additionally, 
there's kind of this line you have to walk between um, bringing in the the pressure or the hard questions when it's right, um, but also not completely alienating yourself from everyone where everyone's super uncomfortable talking to you. Um, I've I've seen with a lot of people that having that kind of relational momentum there, building that relationship where people really trust you, um, that's what allows some people to have these hard conversations. They wouldn't just engage with the stuff right off the bat. Um, so if, if you come out of this Christmas season and there's maybe a relative that you really want to ask hard questions about your worldview and you just didn't find the right chance or you weren't quite there relationally, don't see that as a failure. See that as you're, you're building up a little bit, um, maybe towards that conversation, even if it's just in building the trust. Uh, we just had one more question come in. Uh, I have one more question. This is from Anna. The Bible teaches that God hates sin and commands his people to stop sinning. He sent Jesus to set people free from sin. There are believers who are born anew of God's spirit and love God and genuinely do not want to sin. They fervently ask God to help them not sin. If all of this is true, why do believers still sin? Or at least why do the ones who genuinely don't want to sin anymore still sin? It almost seems like God is asking his people to do an impossible thing, but that he isn't keeping his promise to help them overcome sin. Ever read Romans 7? <laughs> I mean, everyone struggles with this, you know. Even the first century Apostle Paul struggled in a major way with exactly that question. I mean, I guess one way of addressing it is to say that inevitably, if you're genuinely born again and you're a Christian, then the penalty of sin no longer applies to you. But the power of sin through the the carnal nature is still nipping away at our heels all the time. And that was Paul's experience, and that's our experience. And uh, I'm not sure what the answer is beyond that, but uh, the presence of sin is, is simply still there. Well, the power might be broken in terms of its influence on our destiny. The reality is we have to live with that aspect of our nature. Hmm. Cody, you want to jump in? I was basically going to say something similar to David. I was going to say, yeah, Romans 7, Paul directly addresses that. Um, so he kind of took the words out of my mouth on that. I would I would also add as well that the all over the New Testament, we see both Jesus and the apostles assuming the presence of sin in the Christian life, not just in Romans 7. When you have Jesus laying out, forgive your brother 70 times, seven times. If he at the same time is accepting his believers to stop sinning, it doesn't make sense for him to say that. Um, additionally, we have... In 1 John, it says, if anyone has sin, uh, let them confess that to Christ. Um, gosh, there's another one. Uh, oh, like a lot of Paul's community encouragements about like bringing your brother back from sin, about rebuking your brother or something like that. Um, even if we want a really clear example, you look at the beginning of Galatians, where you have Peter kind of uh, acting one way with the Gentile believers and then kind of going in on them when the Jewish Christians show up. Um, so I think following post-resurrection um we have a lot we have a lot of evidence that shows okay sin is still persisting there's something going on here um and we we see it in the early church as well granted there's some faulty thinking about repentance and stuff like that um but right from the get-go christianity is has assumed and been okay with not okay with but i mean it doesn't affect the truthfulness of christianity that sinfulness continues mm. Right. Christ, Christ, the Bible doesn't promise you uh, liberation from sin in this life. Uh, it promises you liberation from sin in the next life. And this life uh, is, um, I would argue, a, a moral probation. And it's um, and part of that moral probation is how we tackle sin in our lives. And uh, you know, G Jesus told us to take sin very seriously. We see that in the Sermon on the Mount, where he instructs people, of, you know, if, if your left eye causes you to sin and, and pluck it out and cast it from you, we should take sin very seriously. Um, but we're, um, we, we're not, we're, we're, there's always going to be temptation in the Christian life. We see this throughout scripture and we can rest in the knowledge that Christ has actually experienced that temptation um, and so he, um, it's in um, Matthew 4 and Luke 4, for example, um, it's alluded to briefly in Mark 1 as well. He's led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And Hebrews 4 says that Christ, um, you know, he, he's, he can relate to us um, in our weaknesses because he has been a man among us. Uh, that he, He's been tested and tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so when we go through sin and temptation in our lives, we can we can know that Christ has experienced it with us, that he's not sitting completely removed from our struggles uh, with sin. I think that is a great place for us to end um, this panel Q&A heading into the Christmas season and being reminded of God providing for us, sending away out of our sins. Uh, I think that's a really, really happy way to end it. So um, thank you to all three panelists for joining. Audience, thank you guys so much for submitting questions either before or during the conversation uh and yeah we we hope that you go into this christmas season blessed that you get some rest with your family uh and then we will join you for another one of these shindigs in january good thank you justin thank you very much awesome thank you guys okay thank you bye bye